Okay, so what we have for the first of these events is our colleague Manfred Lovacler. So Manfred has not been here for 20 years, but well, we feels started like as it. a... It just feels like it. <laughs> yeah, to us. <laughs> so when we started, we were an undergraduate program and then biology and society, and then we, we added and, and grew into a graduate program with various research initiatives and then when we turned into the School of Life Sciences, we started having a number of larger and larger research initiatives. And Monfred has been part of those from the beginning. And part of what made me at several times when I was getting kind of tired with some of the older administration trying to make things happen, and Monfred says, oh, we can do it. And somehow I believed it, and somehow it became true. So he's been a part of making lots of things happen for a long time. His current initiative is in computational history and philosophy of science looking at innovation but how you can understand that through history, through philosophy, through computational tools and he has a number of graduate students and I think he'll introduce all of them so I'll just turn things over to Manfred and the grad students have the responsibility of adding to the intellectual discussion and getting Manfred to stop at the right time. So, <laughs> thank you. So, Manfred, take it away. Okay. Okay. Can we get the lights down here a little bit? Thank you. Uh, okay, well, thanks, Jane, for this introduction. Um, the reason how we got things done is because we never asked for permission. We just did things. And uh, then Jane had to go to some people and apologize for what I did. Uh, and uh, so I find it interesting that uh, you trust me to be first in a room where there are rules. <laughs> uh, no idea what, what even the term rules are. Uh, so what uh, we thought we would be doing is, uh, since it's the Center for Biology and Society, uh, is basically uh, have a conversation about uh, a major obsession that uh, characterizes pretty much everything we do in the lab. And that is this um, tiny little question about how does something generally new happen uh, or emerge in evolution and in history. And that already shows you uh, what we are dealing with. We are interested in uh, evolutionary biology, phenotypic evolution in particular, or the way to history, which is just another word for evolution. Uh, and uh, in both cases, the question is, when do you get something that is novel or an innovation as opposed to just a variation of a common theme. Uh, now, if you focus on innovation, which you, uh, uh, if you're at ASU, you basically more or less have to, uh, because we are, after all, the most innovative university, uh, even though nobody really knows what that means in terms of uh, innovation. Um, I always uh, remind uh, audiences what uh, a famous playwright and philosopher in the 19th century in Vienna said about progress or innovation. Uh, it always looks much larger than it actually is. And uh, that basically gets to the heart of it. Uh, what an innovation or novelty is, is often in the eye of the beholder. And currently, uh, in the current climate, um, where pretty much uh, if you find out a new way to go to the bathroom, it's called an innovation. Uh, so there is an inflation on, innova uh, on innovation. Uh, if you really look more closely into both evolutionary biology and history, you see that the actual number uh, of true innovations is not that high, which makes those uh, events or those phenomena or the more interesting to study and trying to figure out what distinguishes those uh, from just business as usual uh, and normal variation. So what we are doing, and I said this is the major obsession here, and I have this slide up here because uh, it allows me to acknowledge uh, most of the people that contribute to this, particularly also the ones who are in that room. We are doing this in, from several different approaches and several different projects. Don't worry, I don't run through all of them. Uh, but you see the framework, uh, and all of them uh, really uh, have heavy involvement of not only colleagues, uh, particularly in, uh, in Europe and at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, but also graduate students and postdocs here at ASU. So the examples that um, then Ken and Derek will be presenting are mostly from our way of uh, using computational uh, big data-driven approaches to understand the history of science, 
uh, specifically what is a scientific innovation. OK, so what are the challenges in uh, this framework? Well, the challenge is if you want to have a scientific explanation, a theoretical explanation, that current evolutionary biology is pretty much bankrupt uh, and uh, not really capable of uh, accommodating even the question as such. There are some developments, of course, in evolutionary biology right now that allow us to do that, um, but that makes it an exciting field. Um, for those who have some inclination of mathematics, uh, what you need to do is basically uh, change the formal re representation of evolutionary theory from one that operates on a set of objects, such as genes, so if you go into cultural evolution ideas, uh, to one that actually uh, focuses on the transformation of rather complex networks through time. Uh, and that uh, basically is a shift in the mathematical foundation of, uh, of evolution. This is, for instance, something that Naeli and I are working on um, right now. Now, in terms of more phenomenological concepts, uh, what that needs means that we need to integrate what we call regulatory networks with niche construction perspectives. And I'm not going into this right now because we never finish if I would. Uh, but you know, if this is a conversation, people can ask what the hell that means. Uh, just a suggestion. Um, and then I will go on a rant. Uh, now, but what I think everybody uh, can uh, wrap their head around is that if you uh, were exposed to evolutionary theory, in particular also if you talk to those idiot creationists uh, who question it, not that you want to talk to them, but they are sort of background noise, particularly in a state like Arizona, uh, then um, one observation that they always make, and philosophers have also spent way too much ink on this, uh, is the problem of you know, natural selection or, this, uh, or survival of the fittest. That's something that's only selecting what's already there. So where does it come from? Uh, where does variation come from? In particular, where does interesting variation come from? And that's actually a good question. So that's what makes this buzz even more annoying. Uh, and uh, we really don't have a good answer to that question in current evolutionary theory. So this is one that uh, drives our uh, framework here. Uh, another one, and I'm not getting into it, uh, that uh, we also need to actually uh, uh, develop a more appropriate conception of his the historicity or, or history in evolutionary theory, which is another justification why we actually operate on both phenotypic evolution as well as the history of science when we are addressing the question of innovation. And um, since we are not shy of doing grandiose things, we of course believe that we need to develop a theory that captures pretty much everything interesting. Otherwise, life would be too boring. Um, so I said before, what we really uh, need to focus on is a tr formal transformation away from uh, a, a set theoretical representation of a population as a set of objects uh, and moving towards uh, a representation of complex networks and their transformation. Um, that allows for a different type of dynamics and that's a dynamics that you will see in both of Ken uh, and Derek's uh, examples. Namely, um, as we say in the theory of complex systems, it's turtles all the way down. So uh, the nice thing about a network perspective is you can find a network at pretty much every scale. And uh, networks have properties that you can integrate them across scales. And then you can ask questions about what happens between those scales and how do, do those network dynamics change. That sounds all very abstract, but those guys will have great stories that uh, will make this all um, concrete. So just to show that we are not just talking, uh, we actually are publishing. Uh, those are two recent, more biologically inspired papers. Uh, that one is coming out uh, just now in Nature Reviews Genetics, where we applied this to understanding cell type evolution. Um, but uh, this is sort of pretty much the end of what I want to say. Ba basically, give you a conceptual framing. Oh, no, I have a few more slides, probably. Oh, we will see. Uh, a conceptual framing of what this is all about. Um, in biology, the major explanatory focus is not genes 
as individuals, but a regulatory genome as a complex interacting system. Now, in science, we can identify a similar structure, sort of the, a, a theoretical structure or a family of theories and models, whatever language philosophers choose to describe what science is all about, can also be seen as a regulatory network. And if a new variant or a new idea enters that network, uh, it's the structure of the network that determines whether there is a place for it or not. So that's why we have this parallelism between genomes and knowledge structures or knowledge systems. And some of the properties that we have here is that you can then describe evolutionary and developmental history um, basically as a time series or a sequence of complex regulatory states. Now, if you then try to explain what is the causal driver of that dynamic, then you have to figure out at what level does this causality actually operate the most. In the case of a genome, you can say that the genome anchors all those other important processes um, that often are, uh, it's another one of those completely stupid ways of putting things, um, you know, genetics versus epigenetics. It's about the most idiotic distinction you can think of. Um, because it's basically a continuum of causal interactions. It's not something else. It gets all kinds of people all worked out about who is stronger. You know, it's the kind of high school bully yard version of uh, scientific debate. And both are idiots. So, anyway. uh, so, uh, uh, so there are, of course, privileged positions where causality operates, and we need to identify those. Um, then, um, if you have this, you can actually also understand how something new can actually happen. And uh, uh, we talk about this more than when we actually have the examples. I shut up about this. And you can actually then uh, also focus on the dynamics between those different layers. And uh, as I said before, that innovation is actually relatively rare. Um, that actually points to an important phenomenon uh, of why, again, why evolutionary biology is currently not in a particular good shape, because it's a very good theory for what they tell you it does. So as my dear friend Eric Davidson would to, uh, used to say, if you want to know uh, as a petunia fancier, and he hated petunias, uh, <laughs> why, how the colors of petunias change, then evolutionary biology is fine. If you actually want to know how new body plants uh, emerge uh, or emerged in evolutionary history, then that theory doesn't give you pretty much anything. And uh, that already points to the phenomenon that one of the important pieces of evolutionary history is actually the enormous amount of stability throughout evolutionary time, or we would say the lack of innovation despite PR of all the institutions in throughout history. And how do you explain stability in a theory that only accounts for continuous change? That's the main challenge. Evolutionary biologists are not totally stupid. They know that this is a problem. Uh, but they are behaving like uh, Ptolemaean astronomers. So they are inventing one epicycle after another uh, in order to account for those phenomena uh, and don't realize uh, that they have to move away from their geocentric worldview that means from their population dynamic driven theory. Okay, so this is another side. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, and that's a sort of the problem. Mutations get you there is the dogma, um, but what is the effect of a mutation? Um, okay, let's skip this. Let's skip this. Let's, okay. So we do then, uh, uh, we apply this, as I said, not just to biology, but also to history. And we do it with computational method, uh, which, as uh, Ken and Derek will show you, raises a whole lot of questions, practical, technical, and epistemological. And, and this is sort of our diagram of turtles all the way down. So if this is now applied to the history of knowledge, if you want to know change through time in science, you have at least three layers, and you can add many more if you want to where you have one way of representing uh, the change in historical settings and relationships. So all uh, basically social networks where you put in all kinds of data that you have on that. On top of that, 
that system generates the output. It generates science as we know it, the scientific literature. And supposedly change happens there. And what you can then do, you can model uh, with tools that uh, Ken and Tarek will introduce to you. You can model uh, the change in the scientific literature uh, and then ask how is that related to the underlying historical relationships. And sometimes something interesting happens. I remember, remember sort of, uh, uh, Jane, you might you still remember Jorge Wagensberg in Barcelona? So this is, used to be the director of the Science Museum in Barcelona, he was a physicist. And he got very excited about phenotypic evolution at some point. And I heard him once in a talk getting all excited about saying, between an amoeba and us, something interesting must have happened. <laughs> so this is the conception of a physicist. Uh, so to capture those something interesting that happens, uh, to, we have to identify those areas where new ideas actually emerge. And then we can turtles all their way up or down, uh, then we can represent those arguments as a regulatory network of ideas, of concepts in science, and model the change on that level, and again ask the question, what are the relationship between those various networks? And with that, I hand it over uh, to Ken, who basically has a great story, and has applied many of those tools. He is so enamored in those tools that he uses it as an excuse not to write things down because he always <laughs> finds a new way of analyzing the data and comes up with new ideas. So since he never writes it down, we have to give it, get him to talk. <laughs> um, yes, so I do love the tools, and I do get excited when talking about the tools. Uh, so during the discussion, or if there's any elaboration or anything we want to go over, feel free to ask, but um, at Monfred's But really say, don't. Yes, at your own <laughs> risk. <laughs> um, so Monfred's diagram, actually, I really like this here because this framework really applies into a lot of what we do. So um, my work specifically is, so using that framework, is the microbiome something new, or is it just the rebranding of something else? Um, as we look at this here, the biggest question is, what's the microbiome? And if you've been a, in a scientific uh, cavern or hole, you may not have heard of it, but I see it in advertisements for yo plates and for different yogurts. Even you can buy anti-microbial uh, microbiome enhancements now. Um, so as we look at how we understand it, on this side here, this is the general consensus of what the microbiome is, is the microbiome relates to gut flora or the microscopic organisms that include protozoans, viruses, fungi, bacteria that are within the body. This here is the, what I would argue is the microbiome proper or the most established and well-affirmed consensus idea of the microbiome. However, as we look over here, others are starting to introduce the microbiome may include bacteria, organisms that are outside of our body, and that we have different microbiomes. It's not just our gut. Our microbiome includes our hands. We have different hand microbiomes, different feet microbiomes, different lung microbiomes. The other interesting part about trying to understand this question is what the microbiome is. Is, is the microbiome a human thing? Is it an animal? Is it ecological? So trying to understand this within that first diagram of Monfort was saying turtles up or turtles down provides some way of kind of starting to attack this. Um, the other piece that we may have to think about going to complex networks is we know that gut microbiota now has been linked to different health outcomes and different neurological pathways and different ways of understanding obesity and cardiovascular risk, multiple sclerosis. So do we define the microbiome or is the microbiome something that is defined as its relationship to a complex system? Well, so what I did, and that's not showing up, these are supposed to be pictures this is Anton van Leeuwenhoek, and this would be Joshua Lederberg. Not sure whether that's going to come up. However, the microbiome history that most people would agree on is in 1723, van Leeuwenhoek was the father of microbiology, studied animalcules. In 1952, we find the first appearance of microbiome in the scientific literature. And interestingly, no one else, other than the research we've been doing, kind of even mentions this first appearance. In 2001, we have Nobel laureate Joshua Lederberg coining the term microbiome in a landmark paper where he goes and coins over 200 different omic words. 
2008, we have the National Institutes of Health Microbiome Initiative, where they give $150 million to microbiome research. Not saying what it is, what to do, or even defining it, just saying go and do. 2013, the American Academy of Microbiology says there's no agreed upon definition of microbiome. That is reflected in 2014, where we see that the medical subject headings for PubMed or the way a standardized dictionary for biomedicine, for bioinformatics, has no microbiome as a mesh term. So given that brief history, what do we know? Well, we know the microbiome is a thing because we see in JSTOR, PubMed, and Web of Science, the number of articles that are published with microbiome in it has increased almost exponentially. Also, the National Institutes of Health it's funding microbiome research, again, at an increased rate. So this microbiome is a thing. We're funding it, we're writing on it. But how can we tell, as Margaret said, is it truly innovative? Is it changing or evolved through time? And how can we identify this change? So what I've done is, again, going back to Monfort's topology of looking at the research literature, there's 1,312 different journals that have published articles on the microbiome. What's interesting, though, is, is you see this here, one journal has a large distribution of all the articles published. So that tells me as I look at this, we have a lot of different people contributing to this, but we have a major power player, kind of Pareto's rule, if you will. Well, what I did, that actually large bar is PLOS One. So what I did is I took out all of PLOS One articles, and I said, okay, to understand the change and whether it occurred, I'm gonna look at the language within the articles themselves. What does the articles themselves say? Well, if we look at just the ratio of articles compared, PLOS One is usually anywhere from a fifth to almost a quarter of the entire articles within the microbiome, let's say corpus, if you will, or collection of articles. What I did then is the MESH terms, again, the medical subject heading is kind of a standardized vocabulary. It's agreed upon, it's curated, so I chose to use that as a baseline to understand how our different journals, whether they are medicine journals or science journals talking about the microbiome. And you'll notice here, this is PLOS One. Its mesh terms here are medicine and science. So for me, what I did is I said, okay, if I get, let's say, all 1,000 articles and journals, and they all say their mesh terms are, let's say, science and microbiology, I would say then, as I look at that, the microbiome domains or disciplines is pretty, the conversation is fairly narrow within that. However, if we have 1,000 articles and we have 1,000 different mesh terms, and none of the mesh terms link, we have very different conversations, different domains that the microbiome applies to. So this is the mesh terms that are compared to journals. And interestingly, we have very little to nothing here in two, early 2000s. But as we go up, we see increases yearly, except in 2014. The green is journals. The blue are the mesh terms for the journals. And as I look at this, I think that's interesting. Is this an anomaly, or does that mean that the domain, the conversation, the language, the people that are using microbiome have some type of consensus and are starting to filter out other words, other mesh terms, so to say? So going in even further, what we did is we graphed the social network. The circles here are the mesh terms. The size relates to how many times they are apparent within the total journals. Squares here, these are actual journals. We put the mesh terms here for you to see. This in 2007, if you looked at the mesh terms and you wanted to find microbiome research as a researcher, you would look in ecology, microbiology, science, molecular biology. If in 2014 you wanted to find something on the microbiome, this is what you would see. Interestingly, we now have medicine as part of this conversation. The original uh, larger terms have distributed into different constellations, if you will. And what I find interesting is we have kind of this medicalization, as a good colleague, Dr. Buto, would tell me. We have words that appear specifically that relate to medicine, like infection and immunity. We also have gastrointestinal diseases. To me, I think here, for me, using the mesh as a baseline allows us to see a difference in the conversation, but also the way that we're approaching how to understand it through the entire journals to make this in more deeper, why does this apply to you? Why is this anything for someone who doesn't study microbiome research? Well, let's find out, does plus one represent the interesting things that are happening within microbiome? And if plus one does, does it do it for other things? So what I did here is I took the National Institutes of Health abstracts and I said, let's look at the language in here, analyze this, and find the statistically significant or the important words that are Grand abstracts. 
Grant abstracts, yes, that were approved. Do, is there a correlation between the grant abstract, the words that are around microbiome, and the words that are around microbiome in plus one, or in frontiers, or in nature? Because we would think that as scientists, scholars, researchers, historians, that we'd find frontier, bleeding edge, cutting edge, probably in nature, not in plus one. Well, what do we find? Interestingly, nature has the least of the three high statistically interesting terms that are around microbiome of the journal data sets. PLOS One has about 80% for its entire collocates, for top 20 collocates. So for me, when I look at this, it says, okay, if you're a researcher and you want to find something in biomedicine, you could either read Nature, Frontiers, everything else, or you could just hone in on PLOS One. And you'll probably have a pretty good understanding of who's getting funded, how they're getting funded, techniques they're doing. Now this may lead to different arguments or questions or hypotheses such as maybe PLOS One is a dumping ground and because you get funded, you just publish there easily. Or maybe this is where conceptual innovation happens and because nature is a very specific publishing structure that you have to be innovative, you have to be cutting edge, it's losing out and PLOS One is gaining. So I don't know the answer to that. Hopefully we'll find that out. Lastly, I did by year, and again, just to show PLOS One usually has as many collocates as everything else excluding PLOS One. So even 2014, 80 to 90% here. Interestingly, 2008 is when PLOS One started publishing a microbiome. There's nothing before. So 2007, Frontiers has some of the collocates, but that may be expected because no one else is there. So what does this tell us, or what is something interesting that all of you can think about this? Well, if a collocate of a microbiome appears in PLOS One, before the same collocates appear in the NIH abstracts, well, this is true. We may be able to say this structure, the NIH influences not only conceptual innovation, but where it comes from, how it's discussed, how it changes and evolves. Further, we may be able to predict the next major innovation by looking in plus one, as opposed to everything else. So Derek is gonna go into how he finds out innovation very differently from how I do and um, the way I propose. If you do have questions or you want to go further into this, that's for the discussion piece. All right. Um, let me get that. Okay, so thanks, Ken. Um, what I look at in particular is um, evolutionary medicine. That's the example I want to talk about today and the social networks that are involved with it. Um, I want to talk about, so everywhere on the same page, the co-authorship networks. Basically, this is a network where if the individual points are scientists and we draw lines between them if they collaborate on a paper or they publish together, right? And so I use agent-based models to understand how these networks are grown or how they develop over time. And this all comes together in an attempt to understand this grand idea of what innovation is, right? And this can be lots of different things, as Monford was saying. We have um, new techniques, we have new ideas. These sorts of things um, cover broad, broad definitions. Um, one of the things that I take for granted in some of the stuff that I do is that, this I that these ideas come um, from other ideas, right? So they get recombined in a way that we haven't seen before. And this becomes some sort of innovation that we have, right? Um, that, alongside the fact that scientists are collaborating more. We see more people publishing together now than in any other time in the scientific literature, right? And we know that co-authorship networks, these networks based on how people work together, change dependent on the field that we're actually talking about. Basically, physicists collaborate differently than doctors, and doctors collaborate differently than evolutionary biologists, which is what makes it so interesting. Right, we can see here that um, there's been several bits of research where we've looked where um, individuals, uh, Newman and Barabasi in 2004 and 2002, have looked at the way people collaborate and, how does this laser work? Oh, there we go. We see how the networks vary dependent on medicine, um, physics, um, neuroscience over here and medicine. And this allows us to look at how um, innovation can take place in these networks. If the networks vary based on the field, then there must be some sort of interesting thing happening with these networks, 
when some sort of innovation occurs, right? So the question then is, what kinds of collaborations do we expect to see around these innovations, right? So that, in turn, leads me to two very specific questions. How do we identify innovation? And how do we quantify these collaborations, right? How do we tell one collaboration from another? And how do we know when we're actually looking at an innovation? So what I do is I look at evolutionary medicine. Um, and I've I created a evolutionary medicine corpus that I've um, selected individuals from the Evolution uh, Medicine and Public Health Foundation. Um, I've looked at the editors for the Journal of Evolution and Medicine and Public Health. And I've also looked at the contributors for two major evolutionary medicine textbooks that have been published. So we take those, and then I take these individuals, I find out all the research that they've ever published, and I create these co-authorship networks. So the thing about co-authorship networks is they become an emergent property, right? Most of the time, individuals will collaborate with someone because they have similar interests or some other reason. It's not necessarily they're trying to affect the actual social network that they're involved in. So we have individual choice that creates these signatures within the co-authorship networks, right? Scientists decide on collaborators and the network structure occurs. Here we have an actual network from evolutionary medicine at the end, which makes this can seem like a hairball to most people, which is why we can't just look at them and say, oh, here is where the innovation occurs. We have to use some sort of computational tools to do that. So what I did is we take the networks and then we build a model that can recreate them based on metrics that we find within the data. So I look at um, the individual scientist's interests and their social radius. This might seem kind of an abstract idea, but what I do is I look at, um, use computational linguistic tools such as um, keyword analysis and um, LDA topic modeling to computationally analyze two different individuals' publication histories and say something about how their interests are either similar or different. I look at the social radius as what journals are these people publishing in? Because you can't collaborate with someone if they don't, if you don't know who they are. If you publish in lots of journals, you have a large um, reader, right? So you publish in the journals that you read, and therefore you're, the more journals you publish in, the more individuals you're aware of. And the model can also change things like the number of people and how, the, how that evolves over time. Um, I just mentioned this. So here's one of the uh, examples of a topic model. We can see here how these topics are made up of words that are contained within the text of the publications. And we can see how these topics, um, epidemiology and diseases or systems biology, vary over time, right, within the corpus. And then what we do with the keyword profiles is we start with the individuals who publish their publications here. We give them a reference corpus that um, is representative of general American English. Those give us keywords. We take the keywords and then compare them between the individuals, and this gives us the similarity or differences between the two individuals. And we can take that difference, plug it into the model, and compare how those networks are created and how they grow over time. Here, uh, as I mentioned, the social radius. A high frequency of publication in various journals means that you're going to be exposed to more individuals. More individuals, you are going to more likely seek out um, collaborators or a variety of collaborators. And collaborators are more likely to seek out you. Um, now I want to talk about the ways that we kind of compare these hairballs, right? Because it's not just as simple as saying, eh, over here on the left, we see a cluster that looks interesting. What we have to do is we got to compare, right? So we look at how many, how the degree distributions for these networks vary. And the degree distribution is just how many connections do these individuals have, right? So some individuals are going to have many, some individuals are going to have few. 
Um, we can look at how they cluster together throughout the entire network to get a global perspective on these, um, on the way evolutionary medicine uh, collaborates. And then we can look at, um, on a much more fine grain, we can look at the motif distributions between three-person clusterings and four-person clusterings. And this allows us to make some sense out of those big, giant um, networks. And to kind of wrap this up, the reason that this is so interesting, right, is because when we start to look at innovation, when we identify um, these major instances of interest, and we can look at how they grow over time and look at the patterns that may or may not show up in these, what we can start to think about is what kinds of collaborations are they that start to show up around these innovations more often. And if we, do, if we can do that, then we can start to talk about how do we facilitate making these collaborations happen. And I think that's probably the most interesting part of this whole um, journey that I've been on the last few years. Um, I want to go ahead and wrap this up so we can get to some of the discussion. Um, before that, I have a uh, huge long list of acknowledgments here. Um, and honestly, we could not be happier to work with all these people. Uh, Monfred and Jane, um, Dr. Nessie, uh, Michael Simeone, uh, Dr. Nadia Bliss, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Heddle, uh, Mike Rosenberg, uh, who is amazing, uh, programmer. We've got Ken Buteau in the back. Thank you so much for all your help. Um, Nayeli, who's in our lab, um, Eric Pearson, Yulia Damero, um, Brian Daniels, who's been wonderful. Um, we have Mike Rosenberg up there twice. Um, <laughs> he's a good guy. <laughs> um, Matthew, Matthew Scotch, Farouk Mukadam, uh, Martina Mukadam, uh, James Evans, Bill Shee, and um, Brian Uzi. So with that, I want to go ahead and get to the discussion. I think we may be over time a little bit, but um, you'll have to forgive us. It's our first one. <laughs> Okay, we have, exp yes, Steve. So there are a couple, of, this, is, this is of course an essential question. So in, if you talk about uh, phenotypic evolution, uh, you can define uh, innovation vis-a-vis uh, -vis homology. So we have a recognition of homology as the same structure in different organisms irrespective of form and function. And innovation is if you cannot find a similar structure anywhere else. So that's the biological way. How does that work? Similar structure or function? Yeah, independent, okay. independent of it. And then you can actually go into the causal networks that generate this. In science, uh, it's a, 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 a very interesting question. Uh, our intuition is sort of derived from uh, the biological one, where you find that in those regulatory networks that generate phenotypic characters, you can make a distinction between something that's called sort of a character identity network and then a subsequent network that specifies character states. And so the question is, when do you see changes in character identity? And those are particular properties of the gene regulatory networks. So, so take this intuition and look at it uh, in, and, and transplant it sort of in this network of science. So what we're trying to find is through conceptual structures, by analyzing those text corpora, what sort of defines the identity of, let's say, a scientific theory, and what is the crucial network of concepts uh, that are the core, and then you get various variations on that theme. Uh, and what are the changes on that level, of high order level of identity? So it's sort of a way of using a big data intuitive approach to go into something what uh, philosophers have been worried about, uh, theory change and the structures of scientific theories have been arguing from a more case by case basis. And we look at it sort of as something that we can reconstruct from a very large corpus. And those tools that you heard here, the 
the topic modeling tools, the co-locate analysis that all generate characteristic networks that represent those fields, a way to then uh, identify those structures. And with what uh, Derek was saying, we are not just looking at them and say, well, that sort of looks similar. Uh, they are actually very uh, straightforward quantitative tools that allow you to characterize uh, those properties. And that's sort of a way how, you, how we get at that. So what we are trying to avoid is basically reading press releases. In, to put it sort of bluntly in that sense, and so asking you know, how many new structures generally emerge. And the answer is not that many, but that's the difference. Yeah, I think innovation can come in a lot of different forms, in particular um, as scientists uh, discover new things, right? It's not necessarily, um, you know, as innovation occurs, it may not look like what came before it. And hopefully it doesn't, otherwise we're doing the exact same thing, right? But what it, we do know is that the networks change over time. And when these innovations occur and there's a new way of doing things, people work together differently, in, um, at least in the research that I've seen. right? And those are the kinds of things that not only identifying those innovations, but understanding how they got there and what led to those. And then how do you apply these tools to creepiness? Yes. 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 So, so, uh, so actually, so you know, we could have thrown a lot more fun stuff at you. Uh, we resisted, even though we went over time. Uh, but that was to be expected, Jane. Anyway. So, I mean, this is a given. Uh, so, uh, what we did. So, you can develop a whole uh, mathematical calculus uh, based on what's of the theory of what's called signal uh, detection on those complex graphs. And uh, that was Nadia Bliss's dissertation. So we actually developed those tools uh, and then applied it on existing fields where we knew what the innovations were and asked whether we can actually pick them up. And the answer is yes. And uh, the, there are significant challenges in there because it's, you have to build filters that you have to construct and train based on the knowledge that you have on a field. I mean, this is sort of what both Ken and, uh, and Derek were saying. It's, it's a, lot, a lot depends on the structure of individual scientific fields. So you can't get one filter that finds you innovations across all of science. You actually have to work with domain experts and build those filters based on what we know about that field. And then it works pretty well that it picks up additional instances of innovation in those areas of science. A lot of more work to be done to refine those filters, but it, it is possible. And uh, it's uh, the guys, sort of, this is a story, so sort of it's biology and society, sort of the guys who were the first to work on those tools were actually experts in computer network security. Because they have the problem, you have a very complex network, it is a time series of activity. Can you detect some evidence of a hacking attack? Which, in a way, is a slight change in the way those networks behave than they usually do. And so you see, with that in mind, that there is a lot of money behind trying to refine those tools so uh, we could tap into some of that expertise. Yeah, JJ. You know, you picked up on that. I was hoping no one would. So I didn't answer the question, right? And I think that's part of what I'm trying to do is figure that out. And the way I'm doing that is by analysis of the journals, the mesh terms, the other things. My personal opinion, the data that I see right now, I would say that it is an innovation in the medical fields, but not in science proper. So. Why 
Well, I think I can only deal with the evidence that I have, right? I can only deal with, for me, I try to stick with classical statistics and what I can empirically see. So I think if we wanted to, we could say the microbiome is defined with a number of different concepts or latent um, combination of words. I couldn't find that though. That would take year. That would. Uh, I feel to me that would be a daunting task. I do think that there is bias. What you're saying within my uh, data and what I have. I think though that is uh, recognizing that bias and trying to say first off, does the NIH influence this? Right. Just seeing if that happens. Because if we can establish that, there may be some causal linkage between either the NIH and how the concept develops or I believe it's going to be more of a dynamical thing. So I understand there's bias. I agree. I think, to me, it's a starting point. It's not but the Ken, end all. So, so, so he, he has been trained way too well as a, as a scientist. He's very cautious about what he says. <laughs> let, let, let me give you the, the, the real story behind that. Sort of, you're not completely constrained by very cautious statistics. So what Ken f found is the following thing. So you see, you can actually causally track the, uh, the emergence of this whole microbiome literature uh, directly through the infusion of NIH money. So as Ken Buter will tell you, um, if you put NIH and innovation in one sentence, you might ask, be asking for trouble. Uh, so that was sort of a starting hypothesis. What we then found, what, what we Ken found, is if you actually analyze that corpus, now a little more sophisticated than just the, the mesh terms, but we, he's not completely happy with all the statistics yet. So. Um, you actually see, and we topic model that discourse, you see an interesting emergence of a, uh, uh, of a scientific discourse that goes into a variety of new areas and applications, as he was saying. What he then did was the most innovative of innovation here now in terms of the approach. We said, okay, what explains this? And so he, we, he got another data set, and we looked at all the grant abstracts that were funded by NIH and the microbiome. And we see that there is a lot of diversity. So those study sessions uh, have discussions based on what they fund uh, that actively explore the field. Now comes the bad news. That's sort of where the innovation stops. Because if you know what's in the funded grant abstracts, you can predict the scientific literature over the next three years. So what's it, which is sort of an interesting phenomenon. We're trying to understand that better. Because it seems to be, usually what you do, you write a grand abstract, there's something in there, and then you do something interesting. So there's a discrepancy between what's in the grand abstract and what's in the publications. That doesn't seem to be the case in the microbiome literature. Um, again, we need more. Ken sort of says, oh, we can't say this. We have, don't have the statistics yet for all of it. But, uh, but sort of this is where this is going. So there seems to be, on one level, a discussion that drives uh, novel perspectives and new combination of terms, the way uh, Derek was also putting it together, that then determines in a very straightforward way uh, what uh, the scientific record will show over the next, uh, you know, in a three-year window, two to three-year window out from the grand abstract. It's sort of depressing. So not a lot of innovation after the grant. It's one fin fact. But then what Ken also found is that the mesh terms are notoriously bad in actually characterizing the whole discourse. So uh, he hasn't done this yet, but he is working uh, on actively a tool for bioinformatics in that, so biomedical informatics, that might be a better way of characterizing what literature is out there than this very cumbersome system of negotiated mesh terms which do not seem to actually ca capture uh, a discourse that is as explosive as the microbiome discourse. So those are some additional features that uh, throw a little more flavor in there, but uh, I'm just sort of saying, and Ken is probably killing me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it's interesting. <laughs> The NIH, the, in that sense, the, the NIH has been a major factor in causing the whole uh, diversification uh, and innovation in the, high, in the eye of the beholder uh, re related to the microbiome. Yes. On a daily basis for 
from the district from different grant agencies. So the NIH is pressing the problem is, you know, it's the safer use of kids that are able to happen while other funding models are more high risk, high reward research. So can you compare the funding sources to see how the fields are merging? I mean, I think we could compare everything, or we can, I think, again, it's the turtles all the way down. Um, I chose NIH because it's fairly well studied and established how they fund. Also, some of the um, more intricate dynamics of who gets funding within the NIH, each institute or center has to appeal to Congress, right? So there's a, a basis that this is for the greater good or the common good. Um, we have thought about doing NSF and some other things. The NIH at the moment, though, has the most accurate and most up-to-date data for each data set. So again, it, if you're interested, we can talk about different streams. And I know other people, we've applied this and have found different results. But for the NIH, again, the background research that's been done and the understanding of the process as it is allows us to use that. That's the choice for that. So, so I want to sort of put Derek now on the spot, too, because he also hasn't revealed some interesting things he's doing. Uh, and so, uh, can you talk about uh, the directed graphs of co-authorship networks? So, one of the newer um, things that I've been working on is when we think about um, interdisciplinary collaborations, right? When we have um, individuals from two different fields that start working together, we can start to think about which way that interdisciplinary influence is going, right? So, if we have a um, clinical physician and an evolutionary biologist who publish together and they publish in something like um, the Journal of Evolutionary Biology, then what we see then is the influence from the physician, right, is moving towards the field of evolutionary biology. And we can start to think about when these interdisciplinary collaborations happen, um, how that influence is transferred around the network. And it also allows us to employ a new suite of tools for social networks. So previously, um, social networks are undirected or bidirectional, right? All the points go both ways. But when we think about um, when we think about interdisciplinary collaborations, we can start to make those connections directed. And once we can direct those things, we can apply things like um, modified versions of Google's PageRank or directed centrality metrics that, are, that were never available to our, um, as an analytical tool for these sorts of things, for identifying innovation or changes in social networks previously. So I think I'm really excited to see how um, this kind of influence is pushed around in social networks. And once we get to that point, we can start to talk about um, and innovation, when an innovation occurs, which way is that, um, that influence going, right? And, and for who is it uh, innovative for? Okay. So a question for everyone. Um, part of uh, the push I get here is uh, to move toward a network uh, way of thinking about history and evolution. Um, what do you see as some of the limitations of networks as representations of evolution and change? For example, uh, you know, to have nodes and edges, you have to discretize things. So if you want to talk about edges or interactions among spatially distributed things that have actual uh, extension in space, right, um, that can be hard to represent in a network. So I'd be interested to hear what you see as the limitations or gaps of network thinking. I think the big, um, the big um, trouble with networks, right, is identifying those important characteristics with which you're trying to model, right? So we don't want to include a bunch of extraneous stuff. One, it's, it's very computationally intensive. Two, it may, not show, it may not show us anything new, right? So I think the big, um, the big problem or, or trouble with um, network thinking is just identifying those characteristics that are the most important. Right, because if you get, um, you know, these hairballs are nothing compared to when we start to think about Twitter data or um, internet traffic or things like that. So it's important to, to have an idea of exactly what you want to know first and what are the major um, characteristics that you, you should be modeling. 
so, so to give a, a sort of a somewhat glib answer, so uh, following up on what Derek is, the problem if, if with networks is the coarse graining of the, uh, of the data set. That's why you have to uh, keep theoretical physicists around, like Brian, so who, who knows how to do those things. So this is, this is the main challenge, so particularly if you think about harvesting all the data or sort of getting uh, uh, well, this Eric, we recently ran an analysis of four and a half million papers. So, uh, but then you want to coarse grain that data set. And so there you have to then uh, the, uh, apply techniques that actually pick out uh, in a straightforward and rational way um, what are the right representations of an otherwise you know, hugely connected network. Um, and we outsource that to our theoretical physicists. Uh, I think for me, the, the main problem with networks, it's, it's kind of like you and I looking at the same painting and what our interpretation is. Um, I think a lot of networks, um, I think you actually told me back at about, we can get delve into the statistical fanciness, but it doesn't tell us anything new. And I felt like, uh, for me, I usually try to ground myself in more classical statistics. So I think a lot of the stuff I showed was like bar graphs and charts and um, histograms. Um, I think the other problem for me with network statistics is some of the assumptions that you make about space and about how things relate to space. So in agreement with everyone, everyone else has said, I think statistical fanciness and subjectivity are the major problems. Rick. Uh, how do you distinguish between ideas that are important and those that have a sudden change in their fashionability? Uh, moreover, how do you tell for a given literature that uses a given term a lot whether it's for it or again it. <laughs> uh, in, in just doing the analysis of the, the frequency of terms and so on, you're, we can't be sure that the same ideas are being used, we can't be sure, can't be sure what the attitudes are, and we can't be sure, given the, the vagaries of fashion, whether those ideas are important. So how do you separate all those things out? I'll take this. Uh, do you want to? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so the, uh, we actually, it, it, the situation is actually pretty good uh, if you look at the sophistication of some of the tools. So to give you an example uh, of a uh, standard example in the history of biology, or philosophy of biology, concept of the gene. Okay, of course, you can figure out for each paper whether one of the 37 definitions of the gene, or maybe 39, I don't know, uh, is being used. But uh, if you actually analyze the structure of the texts and you let the term gene sort of unspecified and you characterize it by the set of surrounding terms, you can actually get a pretty good idea of what gene actually means in that particular instance. And if you then look at that uh, through a collection or through a historically evolving collection, it's a pretty good way of describing conceptual change. Uh, and so this is why we actually look more into the text and do uh, computational linguistics rather than look at citation analysis. Because in citation analysis, you have exactly that problem. You do not know whether the citation is positive or negative. But if you analyze the text with those tools of computational linguistics, you get at that. Right, the network will change dependent on the way they're using the term, right? And we can look at those just by the terms that surround it. And if you really want to know what, if you need to have a text that you, <laughs> that you, ha that you want to analyze, you know, you have, you have tools that allow us to do that too. But anyway, not a set of tools. Unfortunately, <laughs> life comes in slices of time, even though Manfred doesn't. But so, so thank you guys, all three of you. And on November 8th, when you're sick of hearing about the election, come and listen to Steve Pine and Shelley talk about fire. So <laughs> that's appropriate. <laughs>